All right, what's going on, everybody? Brian Zimmerman here, host of Jazz Is Live and executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine, coming to you on a Thursday afternoon. Is it Thursday? Yes, it is indeed Thursday. You lose track these days. Uh, yeah, nice Thursday afternoon. I'm rocking the John Coltrane shirt. It was John Coltrane's birthday yesterday. We celebrated that a little bit on air. And yeah, this is our cover uh, of an issue from back in the day. I don't know if you could see it there, but all this merch is available on the Jazz Is shop. And if you, too, want to wear your love for for Coltrane on your chest, the Jazz Is shop is a place to do it. Check out jazz.com and uh, browse our merch. Anyway, super excited for our episode today. Our guest is keyboardist David Garfield. So David is a veteran jazz cat and a veteran studio player. Uh, he has played with bands led by the likes of uh, Smokey Robinson, Cher, Larry Carl Carlton, George Benson, the Manhattan Transfer, and the Rippingtons, a lot, lot more that we'll be getting into later. But uh, he has a new album coming out soon called Stretching Outside the Box, on which he teams up with his longtime friend, Grant Geisman, uh, best known for his dynamic performance on the classic hit, Feels So Good. Well, Chuck Mangione, we love that tune, don't we? Um, and saxophonist Brandon Fields, original founding member of the Rippingtons. Uh, so without further ado, oh, before we get to David, let me just mention this, because uh, this is important. The 16th annual DC Jazz Festival will be streaming live from our nation's capital starting tonight, Thursday, 24th, September 24th, through Monday, September 28th. It will be bringing world-class jazz programming to the global stage for the very first time with over 20 performances from international superstars and homegrown talent alike. This year's festival will celebrate the real DC. That's the theme. And DC has a great um, jazz history, music history, period. Uh, you can join the DC Jazz Festival for five days of performances, interviews, and other exclusive jazz content. Watch for free on Gather Events DC or fans.com or on the DC uh, Jazz Fest Facebook page. Learn more about what to expect at the 2020 DC Jazz Festival at DC Jazz Fest. Dot org. All right, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and bring in our guest, David Garfield, and then he and I will talk about what you see on screen. That would be our uh, fall 2020 issue. Go ahead and bring him in, Jeff. Hello, David. How are you, sir? Hi there. I'm doing fine. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for uh, joining us. You're joining us from where? Los Angeles, California. All right. L.A. On L.A. time, but I know you're a Chicago guy, yes? I was born in Cook County. All right. I lived in Chicago for four years. It is near and dear to my heart. I love it there. Love the food. Love the music. So the people are genuine in Chicago. That so way. true. So true. So Jeff, uh, check this out, David. Jeff just had it on screen, but this is indeed our fall 2020 issue. You have been on a ton of iconic albums. And uh, David, this issue is all about albums, collecting albums, listening to albums, producing albums, album cover art. It has been mailed to subscribers now, um, but... You can read all the content from this print issue on our website as HTML articles. You need a digital subscription to read it. Uh, unfortunately, we're offering a special right now for just 99 cents per month for three months. You can unlock unlimited digital access to the site, which means you could read all of the articles in this issue. Plus, we'll enroll you to receive our forthcoming issue, our winter 2020 issue, which is all about jazz and film, jazz and cinema, jazz scores, uh, jazz documentaries. It's going to be a really cool issue. That's coming out in December you sign up now it'll be in your mailbox come december that's another topic you know a lot about david uh film scoring you've done your share of film scoring in your day yes, sir. yeah man but uh i really want to start off talking about this new album stretching outside the box because it's the latest installment in a series of outside the box series and this is kind of cool you don't really see see that this much anymore uh kind of a series of albums uh kind of united by a common theme it reminds me just reading through the titles of you know those great miles davis albums from back in the day steaming cooking walking um you've had a vocals outside the box you've had a jamming outside the box but in a nutshell david what is the outside of the box series what does it represent well it represents what i've done with my musical career which is I started out in jazz, but I was never content to just be in a in a straight box. You know, I, I liked fusion, I liked world music, and eventually I got interested more in R and B and pop. So I kind of always have blended all styles, which has been challenging for me because some uh, radio stations and things are are more in one lane. But over the time of my forty five years doing this, 
I, f I found that it's all filled a nice niche, which is my sound, and it is literally outside the box. That's it, idiosyncratic. Yeah, and the new one's really good. You've been releasing singles bit by bit, which we can get into, but I'm kind of curious a little bit more about your background. Um, just because I know growing up in Chicago, you are exposed to so much music, you know, obviously the great blues tradition. And we were chatting a little bit before we went on air that you didn't even start on keyboards. So what was, you know, growing up musically, what were you listening to? And then how did you make eventually make your way to jazz? What music did you come through? Sure. Well, you know, I was born in 56 and uh, we moved to the East Coast when I was young in the uh -huh. early 60s. And I used to hear jazz on the radio from New York and it was very foreign to me and I didn't relate. But I did get very interested in the rock music. It was very improvisational at the time and it was on FM. There were long songs, long jammings. I really got into that. I was a, really grew up as a rock enthusiast and I loved all the bands. And then by getting into the improvisational music through rock, I found jazz. Hmm. And it was an interesting transition that happened when I was around, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. And I discovered jazz, the world of jazz, and I just loved it. I loved making melodies, improvising on instruments. You know, right. just, to me, it was magic. And who were some of those first keyboardists to really capture your attention in that way? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, originally, I was... I wasn't keyboard oriented when I discovered the music. I was coming from drums, but I always right. played the piano as well and like like learning about harmony and melody. The, the first people that really influenced me were John Coltrane, Miles Davis, but I quickly got into the Blue Note records and I had a Freddie Hubbard vinyl called Going Up, which mm -hmm. I just fell in love with. I listened to these things over and over and over. And um, I believe the pianist on that was maybe Winton Kelly or Hank Jones, but the Piano players that I gravitated to early on were Cedar Walton, uh, Herbie Hancock, yeah. McCoy Tyner, Horace Silver, who later became my adopted father. I had a beautiful relationship with out here in California where, oh my God, I, I mean, I used to hang out with Horace. We once went to see a, a, a dancing show and he leaned over to me after Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and he said, I used to play that song on the gig with Preds. Wow. And I looked up and I'm like, oh my God, you know, he's talking about like just I would say how I played with Freddie Hubbard or somebody. Right, right. But, um, you know, Horace was one of my main, and Chick Corea it was very influential at the time that I got really into it. Both he and Herbie, I would have to say, were my main influences. Chick had the original Return of Forever, which had the Fender Rhodes. Right. And I love the sound of the Rhodes, and Herbie had the Headhunters. So wow. that's kind of where my roots are, you know. Gotcha. I mean, grew up in rock and then Blue Note, and naturally it would lead you toward fusion. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's um, it's funny. Um, um, the piano player you're talking I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on this name. Who became your adopted father? Horace Silver. Horace Silver comes up a lot on this show, and the general consensus is that as a band leader, as a player, he's certainly respected, but not nearly as much as he should be. I mean, this guy was a real titan, and maybe he, because he stuck to songbook repertory, although he wrote so many of his own compositions, um, he's just not on as many Mount Rushmores as you would expect him to be. It's interesting with Horace Silver, though. Uh, we went to an event at the House of Blues here in L.A. with all the rockers and blues, John Mayall, all these people, Lowell Fulsome. Yeah. And then halfway through the thing, they were being asked questions. They'd started pointing to Horace in the audience and said, we listened to him. He was our influence. And I believe that oh. Horace came up with the, I think he invented the, the uh, term funk. Oh, he, uh, he had a song called he Opus, well have. Opus to Funk, right. And that was a long time ago. And Horace was into blending the straight eighth note rhythms. Of course, Song for My Father is one of his most famous works. One right. of the most famous jazz songs you'll ever hear. And I have it on my jazz outside the box. I have a beautiful version of it. Yeah. Uh, with uh, We had um, poetry done on it. Horace had written lyrics. And okay. I had a copy of it. They had been recorded. And I had the drummer who played with me, John Densmore, who was actually the original drummer from The Doors. Cool. A huge jazz fan. And he read the lyrics. Quite cool. Yeah, absolutely. And we're getting comments. Um, Gary is letting us know on f on Facebook. Song for My Father is an epic album. It absolutely is, Gary. And uh, yeah, we love Horace. 
he should be up there with the greats. He is in a lot yeah. of ways, but you know, yeah. he, he does get enough love as a band leader, as a as a player. But well, maybe in this modern times, I think there was a transition with Chick Corea's electric band when people started really tuning into the newer players like Dave Weckl and John Could, Yeah. Before then, there was another generation of guys, um, Art Blakey, you know, uh, Max Roach. I mentioned John Petitucci. You know, I had the pleasure of playing with him when he was still living and here in town with his parents and coming up as a young. I've seen a lot of musicians come up. I must tell you this because I'm going to be 64 on Sunday. Oh, and happy I, birthday. Thank you. I've seen people come up like um, John Petitucci was one of them. Russ Freeman from the Rippingtons, he used to come to all my shows and I kind of mentored him. And when he did his, I got him his first gig at the Baked Potato. And, and I, you know, I just, I've been around a long time, maybe like Horace, and behind the scenes, I haven't been putting my name out there. I mean, I spent a lot of time with George Benson. They're over 30 years as his musical director. So, wow. It was a great gig. I mean, yeah. And how'd you get that gig? How'd you come about that gig? Um, well, Jorge Dalto, his original music director, pianist, had gotten cancer, so he he was oh. enough when they needed a replacement. And I knew all the guys in the band. I knew the manager. But what happened was my first gig with George, which, by the way, is on video. They recorded the first gig. It was at Montreux, Switzerland, and cool. it's been out on video. It's crazy because we didn't have any rehearsal. I didn't have charge. <laughs> I was winging it. But right. the, the uh, thing about that when I met George, the, right away he, he found out that I had played with Freddie Hubbard, and we had that that CTI connection. He immediately okay. yeah. connected with me. But see, jazz has gone a long way uh, since I started with with the Chick Corea Return of Forever, Herbie and Headhunters, CTI records. Yeah, that was fusion in the early days, you know. Totally, yeah, uh, they were uh, uh, definitely groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Fender Rhodes, guitar, yeah. drums. I mean, and it was all, if you really want to know the truth, I believe it was all derivative of Bitches Brew. I believe Bitches Brew spawned the entire fusion movement. Right. And then there were labels that CTI that took it in a more popular direction, mm -hmm. using it with other kinds of music, you know, that were popular at the time. And um, CTI used the orchestration. They had big orchestration. Right. The best key. right. Right. Freddie Hubbard's First Light was an amazing song. CTI Records, Jack DeJunette, George Benson, and it won a Grammy. And that's that's when I joined Freddie right after that. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so with George, it was right at this. And George is another interesting story where you watch videos of him, you know, because he has straight ahead chops for days. I mean, you know, he could be he could have been a straight ahead jazz guitarist and made a Totally different name for himself. Uh, he just happened to be this amazingly talented singer as well. Um, so it sounds like you kind of got to witness uh, that the evolution. Not that he changed permanently in any one direction, because he could always do it all. Um, I had the thrill of producing the Guitar Man record. I was oh, a co wow. producer along with wow. John Burke at Concord. And we did, on the Guitar Man record, which was 2010, we did Naima. We did My Own One and Only Love some other really cool jazz tunes. We got him back into his jazz roots. Yeah. George started out as a vocalist. Uh -huh, he right. learned to play guitar so he could get the gig with Jack McDuff. <laughs> and he was not considered a good guitar player. He's just at the beginning, I'm saying. He right, right, starting out. Guy. He learned, whatever he learned, he's going to be the best at it. Right, right. And he did. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. And which, uh, which Freddie Hubbard's did you, uh, Freddie Hubbard albums did you? Appear on? I recorded with Freddie on Bundle of Joy, which okay. was CBS, uh, Sony, whatever it was called. And um, it was 1977 we recorded it. And uh, we were really excited. Freddie recorded two of my songs. Um, I got to play the whole record with him. Um, I loved working with him. I had to stop because he was having problems being reliable on the road. And he would, he would leave us in Europe and he would leave us in San Francisco. I just... I couldn't deal with that. So the biggest mistake I made was I associated that with all jazz musicians. And I learned later it was just Freddie. <laughs> I, I realized I've met some other wonderful guys like Joe Henderson and, um, oh, the Marsalis. There's so many great people in jazz. But I started oh, yeah. out on the edge, you know. Yeah, yeah. Freddie was quite edgy. There was a whole scene. Those guys had become very edgy to survive. And I learned a lot from Freddie. 
and he grew up with great prejudice, I must say. I, I, yeah. When George, too, he told me when they traveled the South, they had to register in the police station when they came to town. First thing they yeah. did is go to the yeah. police station. Wow. Can you imagine that? Wow. Uh, right. And they overcome those. They overcame those things. Well, I learned so much from George. And then George, I want to tell everybody listening, to take five from the Montreal Jazz Festival with George and myself and Sadat Watanabe. It's one of the best George Benson things I've ever seen in my life. And he he feels the same way. All right. Noted. And we can check this out. There's video evidence, right? Yeah. Oh, he's killing it. Very cool. Very cool. So he played on Outside the Box. I got George to play guitar solo on my song, Stay, which was right. co-written with Shaka Khan. And um, we did that, David Sanborn. I cut George's solo in half to give David Sanborn the second half. <laughs> I don't think George... The choices have. you have to make in this industry, uh, you know? <laughs> but uh, that's great, man. Um, I got a chance to work with the late Wallace Roney. Oh, wow. Yes. We did a Miles Davis tribute song called uh, East Lou brew that you wrote so this is your composition yeah i wrote that one and i used vince wilburn who's miles's nephew oh we know vince wilburn very well he co-hosts our miles monday show oh he's i see God Miller. thank you hey, guys i one of our great great collaborators he's just put his name up there hey there gussie thanks for writing in respect to the maestro david garfield yes indeed gussie's great he's yeah. sad version of I won't back down and he does live shows with us and he's very modest his cousin Marcus Miller is also I've heard is a decent <laughs> yeah we're familiar uh very cool so let's talk about the new album because um a version of won't back down appears on this new one stretching outside the box right mm -hmm. so and this is cool because you actually played with Tom Petty yes I have played in front of Tom Petty <laughs> <laughs> okay my band members, uh, I should say, all of the Heartbreakers have played on my records. And my drummer, Steve Ferroni, one of my favorite drummers, is from the Heartbreakers. So, gotcha. so I've never got to play with Tom, but Tom came to our show one night and sat right in front of me, and he loved it. He loved it. And then the next time I saw him at a Heartbreakers rehearsal, he said, you're that crazy keyboard player, aren't you? <laughs> Very nice. Well, he obviously appreciates the jazz chops, and he strikes me as a dude who would you know, have an ear for jazz. Um, so that's very cool. And how about your own, how did you, speaking of ears, um, what was it like to translate that tune? Because again, this single is out, right? You've released this single from the new album, it's out. Yeah. Well, so let me just quickly explain that so that people don't confuse. The genesis of this project was, I never sat down thinking, I'm gonna do Outside the Box and all these volumes. All I started doing was recording songs in the studio. That's the yeah. genesis of this project. I had a list. I made a bucket list. I want to record with Marcus Miller. I want to record with David Sandler. There's a song I wrote with Smokey. I want to record it, you know? So that's how it started, with 12 songs on a piece of paper. Gotcha. And as I started recording, I got really into the recording thing, and then we'd do a session with somebody for one song. We'd say, well, as long as we're here, let's do two more songs. Then it just started growing and growing and growing. The ideas started growing. And then I still hadn't released anything, and people would say, you should do, an out, uh, you should do a box set. You should do a box set. I said, no, I think it's too much music to give people at once. I met with some radio promoters here in LA and they said, they heard one of my songs and said, we can get this on the radio. So I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put out one song, not a record, one song. So that's how it started. I put out Go yeah. Home, which featured uh, Kirk Whalum. It got to number one on the radio. Then I followed up with another song. I never had a plan for the album. So then eventually I had to come up with a plan. So I divided some of the songs into the jazz outside the box, the more grooving, R&B oriented vocal stuff on jam, jamming outside the box and then the hardcore vocal stuff for Vox outside the box. Stretching outside the box is all the fusion stuff. It's really yeah. my music. Yeah. And I've saved it all the best for that. So uh, we've been releasing little singles here and there, but there's a quite a bit more material in the can for stretching. It's going to be uh could be a double CD. Cool. Yeah, uh, and Won't Back Down is a great tune. You released another single very recently, Sir Charles. Now, you know, yeah. the only Sir Charles I know, uh, that would be the round mound of rebound, Mr. Charles Barkley. But who is this Sir Charles dedicated to? Well, that was a friend of mine, Vince Charles, one of my mentors. He was from the Virgin Islands and played the steel drums. And he was with the old, well, first with Herb Alpert's T1 of Brass when I came out here and I was young. 
he was doing really well. And then he ended up with Neil Diamond, but a good friend of mine and mentor from the Virgin Islands. I learned a lot about the music of the Caribbean when I came out here. Because it's so, I came out here from St. Louis. That's where I learned to play and started professionally, which is a rhythm and blues town. We didn't have yeah. salsa, we didn't have reggae and uh, calypso. But I'll tell you right now, I've been very blessed to have played all these different styles with the people from those ethnicities. And um, I learned the calypso stuff and what they call soca. And sure. I learned it from these guys in Trinidad and um, in Virgin Islands. So Sir Charles is a, is based on a soca rhythm. It's like, you know. It's very much of a yeah. party song. Yes, totally. Nice Caribbean groove there. So that is out right now. You can stream it on any streaming platform. Um, but you do, you know, and it was, again, written to your friend. You've done some nice tribute work throughout your career, um, including an entire album dedicated to the music of Jeff uh, Porcaro. So tell me a little bit about Jeff Porcaro, because, again, you wrote an entire al album dedicated to him. Some of our jazz-centric fans might not recognize that name, even though they will recognize his music. Um, so who is Jeff? Okay, so when I came out here in 74, everybody was talking about Jeff Porcaro, Jeff Porcaro. Yeah. He was... The, uh, the great drummer, uh, everybody wanted him to play on their records. He played on the Boz Skaggs Lowdown record, song Lowdown. Okay. He played on a whole bunch of other hit songs. Um, he was a go-to studio drummer, and then he formed a group called Toto. Of course. So the way it works, his younger brother Steve is my age as a keyboard player. So when I came out here, I met Steve. We became keyboard buddies. I had the Fender Rhodes. He had all the synthesizers. We kind of taught each other different things and we're still really close friends. And um, so his brother Jeff was like the big guy. Everybody yeah. just loved him. And I eventually got to, to meet him and work with him and got to know him. And I wrote a song with him. We had a band together. And so when he passed, he passed un, untimely at 38 with three small wow. kids in 1992. Ugh. When he passed, uh, there was a Japanese company who wanted to do a tribute record to him. And a lot of people were, wanted to do tribute records, and they approached me. And I thought it would be a good idea for me to do it because I was very close with the family. And so we could do something really tasteful, and we involved the entire family. On the tribute record, we had his kids playing. We had his nephew. We had his brothers, his father, and wow. his godfather. Wow. Yeah. No, it's a great record. Um, and, yeah, again, Jeff was – just everywhere as a studio musician, you know, has played with everybody. Um, I want to talk about, uh, go ahead. Sorry. You know, to cut you Floyd, off. Bruce, right. Bruce Springsteen, all those people. He was on Don Henley, a lot of big hits, you know? Yeah. I want to talk about another big name you dropped earlier, and that would be Smokey Robinson. Um, you both recorded and performed with Smokey and you, did you write a song with, for Smokey? Do I have that? Too? No, we wrote two songs together. We, together? Smokey and I wrote a song for George Benson. Wow. And okay. What tune was that? One Like You. And One Like You, okay. George recorded it on songs and stories. And, I mean, we, we weren't particularly... It wasn't... Let me put it this way. It didn't come out exactly the way we hoped it would. So hmm. I had a big desire to, to re-record it and release it with Smokey himself, you know. Wow. It had something to do with the key and the way Smokey sings. It kind of goes into some different ranges, and it wasn't as suited for George as maybe it would have liked. But with, with our version with Smokey, we brought in Michael McDonald to do background vocals. So we got Smokey and Michael kind of <laughs> bouncing off, and then we got David Sanborn to do the solo. Wow. It's beautiful, man, and that's been one of our most successful songs. So, no, I've had the privilege of writing two songs with Smokey, he comes over here to the house. We're going to be in the studio next week. I'm doing strings for a couple of songs for him. Okay, and, nice. Um, the thing I'll say this, just for all the listeners, all the great artists respect jazz. Hmm. And all, oh, there's Tony Polizzi chiming in. Welcome. This hey, Tony. talented guitar player plays on our records. Um, you know, uh, all the great artists love jazz and all the great musicians that play the studio music. Um, the tracks for the artists are influenced by jazz. Yeah. And um, Smokey has, has really blessed me because 
I'll give you a little anecdote. I went to meet him the first time. He wanted to meet me and see if he wanted to work with me. So I showed up to the studio. I didn't know what to do to prepare. I walk in and he says, hey, hey, you know, let's do this. Um, you know that song, such and such? And he goes, you know the song, I want you back? And I blanked. I had a complete meltdown. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and, well, I don't know. <laughs> so turns out it was a Michael Jackson song. I just had a block against it. He goes, I want to do a new version of it. It was kind of jazz, smooth jazz with some cool chords. So I was on the spot, I just arranged it and came up with some stuff. And I thought, oh, this is atrocious. <laughs> um, I left the thing. I said, oh, I've totally blown this. I'll never hear from the guy. On the way out of there, five minutes, my phone rings. Smokey wants to work with you. Wow. He just felt the chemistry. Oh, you, you know? Yeah. You really must have wowed him. And we're talking to Jack. I want you back. Jackson 5, right? Yeah. And so yeah. on the album, Time Flies When You're Having Fun, there's a bonus track of that. Yeah. And I got the great Bobby Shue to play trumpet. So I pulled oh, in I some Bobby. interesting things. Like Bobby wouldn't work for anybody, but he did it because we had a relationship. And he played a beautiful flute horn solo on it. Yeah, we put, put it into a thing. I don't I know. I say, can you play some of that, the, that yeah. hip cordage? <laughs> and it was totally unrecognizable from the original. But it was cool. cool. That, Smokey man. loved it. So I did that record with him, and then I did another record with him. But um, now we're working on something new. But what I was going to say is that he appreciates, you know, it's funny. Like, I just play myself, and I think I'm doing an average job, and he appreciates what I do. And he said, hey, oh, Ricardo. This guy makes these shakers is watching. Cool, cool. Um, hey, Ricardo. Yeah, I got a shout out. Mo Better Shaker Race. Um <laughs> The thing about um, about Smoke is that, you know, he came back with this song that we worked on, and he said to me, and we did it with Steve Ferroni on drums from the Heartbreakers, Freddie Freddie Washington, who's with Steely Dan now, and James Harrow's great session. Smoke says, all the funk is in the keyboard. And I'm like, well, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> because, you know, as a white guy, he was played with black bands all my life to, to hear that my part stood up like that really the ultimate compliment, man. The ult that's where the funk is. That's where the funk is. Now, were you writing lyrics too? Are you a lyric writer? I dabble. Like I'll throw in some ideas, but I don't consider myself a lyricist. That's a tough art form, you know. That's like writing poetry. Yeah, I mean, I I throw in some ideas, but um, I know where my limits are, you know. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Let me, uh, let me just say one more thing, because I alluded to. I don't mean to be pushy, but I want to say this: what's going on in the world today. I was blessed to be taken under the wing of, of African-American musicians in St. Louis in 1973, 74, when I started. And they took me under the wing, and they were so supportive and loving of me. And all my career, I have been working with people from all over the world, British people, Cuban people, you know what I mean, African people, even Scandinavian people, all mm -hmm. kinds of people. And we're all, in the music, we're all together. We're all totally family no barrier one of the earliest art forms to integrate the bandstand and has been ever since you know and whenever the major names would get pushback for doing that you know from benny goodman to miles davis they'd say these are musicians you know they're you know black white these are musicians and and they all belong on this bandstand so i hear you i hear you david yeah, that's beautiful I got to ask about one band at the end here I read it, that you have played with that I found so amazing. Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you really play with Spinal Tap? Yeah, I recorded on their second album, which is called Break <laughs> Like the Wind. Yeah. <laughs> and um, here's my funny Spinal Tap story. So I go in to play on this record. I go into the studio. Now, I've seen the movie, and I think it's funny. I go into yeah. the studio, and there's a bunch of guys sitting around, and I walk in and I look at them, and then I walk right past them into another studio, look around. No one's in there. I come back to these other guys. They're all three of them sitting around, and I go, do you know where Spinal Tap is? <laughs> and it was them. It was them. Christopher it was Guest. The yeah. Spinal Tap moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got such a kick out of it, but they weren't wearing their makeup. Right. So well, those are Yeah. Those guys are just so funny, and Christopher Guest is a. Um, they're all real musicians, right? 
And, Gary uh, Shearer is a talented bassist. Yeah. Wife Judith Owen is an amazing singer. Yeah. And uh, Mike, what's his name? Michael. Um, Michael Mc, McEwen. Yeah. McEwen. Another, he, he plays guitar, right? I assume, yeah. And is a great instrumentalist, can sing. And that movie, it was just, there are a few movies that get the humor of what it's really like to be a musician. I think Blues, for the Blues Brothers is one. Spinal Tap is far and away. They, they just get it. They get the humor, you know, of first life on the road. I, first time I saw Spinal Tap, I didn't laugh. Really? It's too close to home. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Then it became yeah. funny. But, you know, I've met some of the British rockers, like, and, and I believe that Jeff Beck was part of the impetus for that. And I, I've met Jeff and had the pleasure of hanging out with him. And, you know, there's some musicians that were able to just say that, you know, I want, I want this, I want that, you right. know, it's just as a jazz musician, I haven't had that, that luxury, but right. Right. And they were actors, you know, and in their improvisation, I mean, you could just tell that there was a musical quality to it. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, was there anyone else? Because you played with everybody, you know, Cher, uh, um, you know, uh, who else have you played with? Boz Skaggs, uh, who really kind of surprised you, Michael Bolton, who surprised you with their thorough understanding of jazz or, you know, their, their jazz musicianship? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, First of all, Michael Bolton, I did some work with him in the studio before he was Michael Bolton. He was just a songwriter out of the East Coast. And this producer I worked for, Patrick Henderson, had me come down to this. And I said, oh, man, you're great. I mean, I loved his energy. I loved his songs, his voice. Um, you know, I think everybody has a love of good music, you know. Um, yeah. Um, the thing is going, just going back to jazz, like, you know, I've been lucky that I got to work with Boz Keggs, who was one of the, that was considered one of the better gigs out here. I got to record for Cher and so forth. You know, I did the Van Morrison duet with George, which I really enjoyed in London. We recorded at Van's studio and, um, I arranged the song, but what I'm wow. getting at is my high, we talk about jazz, just going back to the roots. And this is the thing that's always been difficult for people. I'm a true jazz musician at heart. But I've learned how to transcend into so many situations to survive. Yeah. And um, the true jazz, you know, I had to play. I got to play with Freddie Hubbard. I got to play with Freddie Hubbard when Woody Shaw jumped on stage and challenged him to a trumpet duel. Wow. I played with Art Blakey at the Village Gate. Art jumped on stage with us with Freddie. I thought, I'm in the Village Gate with Freddie Hubbard and Art Blakey. It's like the jazz messengers. And Art got on the drums and went, ah! <laughs> Like and I was, 350 I no beats per minute. Yeah, trial I, by fire. I didn't know what song it was. I just, <laughs> but I, I eventually started playing. I mean, I've had such, I got to play with Eddie Henderson. These are all names from the 70s. And they, oh, Joe yeah. Henderson. I played with Joe Henderson. Um, and you know, Blue Mitchell. I showed up. I mean, I showed up for the gig at the Parisian room and Blue Mitchell was on trumpet. It's like, I've been so lucky with that. Then I'll just tell you one one prime thing. So with the first night with George Benson at Montreux, I'm on stage at the Encore. Who comes out on stage? George Duke and Herbie Hancock. Wow. And I they, just, they were just dropping by? They always did that at Montreux. Yeah. Every night yeah. at Montreux, they, at the end of the show for the Encore, somebody would kind of, they, they'd organize it. They'd say, yeah. you go out and play, you go out and play. So, so George came to my side of the stage and used my rig, and Herbie went to the acoustic piano side. And it, they did Chameleon, and it was mind-blowing. And I was just lucky. You know, I got, I'll tell you, the one other great story is a Stevie Wonder tribute they did downtown L.A. for the Grammys. Stevie got up on stage and was playing Another Star, which was one of my favorite songs. He was playing it on um, the Motif. No, he, yeah, he was playing on the Motif synth. Herbie got up and was playing on the Suitcase Roads because Herbie played on the original. George oh, wow. did the voice on the original. Da 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 da. You know. George yeah. did the voice. He goes, George, George. But George had left. And then I was standing right there, and Ricky Minor saw me and goes, Come up stage. I got on the acoustic piano. And I'm looking up, and I see Herbie and Stevie, and I'm playing. Oh, and I laid down some wow. stuff, and I saw Stevie do this. I you know, know you heard me. Dug it. He dug it. <laughs> and then five minutes, about eight bars later, another guy came over to me and said, it's my turn to play, and I had to get up. All oh, good man. things come to a sudden and horrible end. 
<laughs> well, that's about as good of a thing as they come, man, playing with Herbie and Stevie Wonder. And uh, well-deserved, man, David. Uh, and and it's been a pleasure talking with you for this half hour, man. This has been incredible. You've, you've got stories for days. So we're saying you, you may have to come back and more stories, more tunage, more jamming. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be able to listen to these singles that you've put out um, and wait for your new album, Stretching Outside the Box. Do you have a release date on when that may drop? Probably, we're thinking May 11th, 2021. Okay. But there's a single coming out very soon uh, called Rainbow Seeker, which will be on that. And um, that's a Joe Sample song that I absolutely love. And um, thank you for that comment, Lavinia. Lavinia. Um, the Rainbow Seeker is one of Joe's songs that I just love, and I've recorded it with the great uh, Steve Jordan on drums. He's a wonderful Oh, wow, drummer. sure. Yeah, he's been on the show. And we have um, Marcus Miller and Chuck Loeb. Chuck played on it right before he passed, and then Tony Polizzi and Dean Parks and Lenny Castro. And that'll be out, I think, October 9th. But every week there's a new... Yep. release and we're we're just thrilled with the response we're getting and the music so so fresh and like you say outside the box it doesn't fit into one box it's just music to be enjoyed and it's everything from duke ellington to um you know jimmy hendrix you know what do you want that's right man it's good music and that's what Duke Ellington says. There's only two kinds, good and bad. Uh, David, man, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks to our viewers uh, for you know commenting, saying hello. Thanks to Lavinia, our friend Lavinia Gunner, Stephen Torres. What's up, Stephen? Um, Ricardo, the Smooth Jazz family, Gary, all of our friends. Um, thank you for watching. Please follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Hit that notification bell so that you know whenever we are going live. That will do it for this week. You were the final interview for the week, David. We'll be back uh, on Monday with another episode of Miles Monday with your friend Vince Wilburn Jr. We'll be uh, celebrating Miles with a trumpet summit. So you're going to want to tune in for that on 5 p.m. on Monday. David, thank you so much again. I will see you backstage when I'm going to sign off with people watching at home. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Do, 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 do. Playing me out. Appreciate that. <laughs> We have to do a Jocko day one day. All right, David. <laughs> we got a version of that too on the record. That'll also be on stretching. There's oh, very cool. Bass players. Oh, nice. How many bass players? 16. Oh, my God. David. Lee, uh, Jimmy Johnson, Henrik Linder from the Dirty Loops, uh, a few others, John Patitucci. Bunch of good guys. Man, a lot to look forward to you with, uh, to, with you, David. All right, man. I'll see you backstage. So Love long. Love to everybody. Peace and solidarity. That's right. Stay Good safe, music. man. Okay. Thank you. See ya. All right. So thanks again to David Garfield. Again, the new album, Stretching Outside the Box. We can expect it next year. But at the meantime, we've got these singles to keep us satisfied. Uh, the latest one was Sir Charles. Says you can stream it right now on any streaming platform. Wanted to remind you again about our fall 2020 issue which is all about, once again, the art of the album. Album collectors, vinyl freaks, record collectors, turntable aficionados, you are going to love this album. We get into a little bit of everything. Again, it's already been mailed to subscribers, but you can read all the content, all the great stories from this issue on our website as HTML articles. Uh, you'll need a digital subscription to do that, and for just 99 cents per month for three months, you can unlock unlimited digital access. Sign up right now on our website, jazzes.com. Click that subscribe button, and you'll be good to go. Like I said, that'll do it for this week. I We'll see you on Monday uh, with a very special Trumpet Summit edition of Miles Monday. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Brian Zerman. So long, everyone. <laughs>